the clouds A strange and lovely sound I hear it in the thunder and the rain It's ringing in the skies Like cannons in the night As the music of the universe plays Sing your holy We're singing was 
Yeah, they're totally clapping for us. So it was not, not don't get cocky, guys. It was totally <laughs> for Amy and I. Hey, good morning. Good My morning. name is Adolf. I am the director of student ministries here. My name is Amy, and I am the kids co-director. Yeah, welcome, everybody. Welcome to those streaming online. That must be nice. Comfort your own couch. We are much better in person, though. Pete always says that, and I believe it to be true. Um, so... Forgive me, I've had three hours of sleep. Our power went out last night. I don't know who's cheering Anyone for else? power outages. Oh, the wheels. You guys are, you guys live right, right next to us. So yeah, it's rough. Okay, so there might be pain in the, in the night, but joy comes in the morning. We're glad that you're here. Absolutely. Um, Way to tie that in. Good that's job. why Sean's saying that, yeah. Um, <laughs> you guys will find these convenient little connect cards in the seat back in front of you. Uh, if you are new here or just want to know more about our church, you get connected, yeah, connect cards. Uh, you could fill that out and then drop those in the tithe box that's just to the right of the double doors as you exit. Uh, and then that gives us an opportunity to get to know you. And then, like I said, uh, for you guys to, to get plugged into what we're doing here at the church. Yeah. Uh, this Tuesday night at 6.30, we are having an all-church meeting here in the sanctuary. This is a chance for you to come and learn about what we're doing here at SBC and kind of see the direction that we're going as a church. Um, we're just kind of looking at where is God leading us. And so this is a chance for all of us to get together and just kind of have a chance to, to look at the direction that we're going. Um, if you have specific questions use that connect card that's in front of you and put it in the tithe box in the back. That way we can um, prepare and know what questions are gonna come our way and then it's not just a big Q&A time. Um, we can actually kind of have some stuff planned. So if you have any specific questions, make sure you fill out that connect card. Yes. Also, next Sunday is gonna be our kickoff Sunday. So what that means is uh, with the start of the new school year, it's also a start of our new ministry year. This is going to be an opportunity for, for us to get plugged in to life groups and re-engine and re-engage and all the, all the different programs and stuff that we put on here. Uh, we're going to kick those off next week. Uh, and so there's going to be a bunch of food, but that's not the point. Um, it's, we always but have food, it? but yeah. 
not the point. Uh, we just want to encourage you guys to, to get signed up, to, to be involved in what God is doing here. Uh, we're called to be his hands and feet. And so this is a great opportunity for us to, uh, to walk that out, to live out our faith uh, in community and join some stuff that we have going on here. Yeah, let kids go. Um, anyways. Or student ministry. Speaking of yeah. kids go, if you came into the back, you saw some balloons, and we also have cotton candy going on outside. Today is what we call Move Up Sunday. It is where students started the new school year. They're moving up into different grades, different classes for kids co. Um, it's, it's a fun, fun vibe back there. So go check it out, um, and you're welcome for feeding your kids cotton candy and then giving them to you at the end of service. Um, but also that means that we have some new seventh graders in service with us today. Um, yeah. Yes. Welcome. Welcome to the big church, the sanctuary. We are so excited that our seventh graders are in here and just joining the church on their next, their next step of their journey. Um, so this is big, but just know that this whole church is here for you. Um, and so... As adults in the church, please also be looking for those new, those new students that are in our midst. Yeah. And you students who are in our midst, for your transition, uh, we have these student uh, sermon notes. So you guys can find these on the back table where all the Bibles are stacked or on the desk in Kitsko. Uh, and you guys, this is just going to help walk you through the sermon, right? Pete, he could be kind of crazy, right? So in order to follow along, this is very helpful. It might help. Some of the adults, too. Yeah, grab one. We're starting a new sermon series. Who knows how many years we'll be in this one. (laughs) It's good to laugh in the morning. That's good. All right. Also, before I get kicked off and my mic gets turned off, uh, we have these um, student event calendars. Um, So any parents, uh, these are available on the connections table out front or on the kids' code table in the back. Uh, And what this does is it just walks you through some of the events that we have going on in the year. And on the back, it walks you through the curriculum, uh, kind of rough curriculum outline for each month that we're going through. So even if you're not a parent, I would encourage you guys to to pick one of these up. And it gives you specific ways you can be praying for us in student ministry. Okay? Good. I think that's all of them. Yeah, Yeah, you can pray for us now. All right, so quiz, seventh graders, repeat everything we just said back. (laughs) I'm kidding. Okay, let me pray, and then we'll get off the stage. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, thank you for the joy of laughter. Thank you that we get to gather as as your body, Lord, and to sit under your word that is alive and and breathing, uh, Lord, that has authority over, over our lives. Help us now to, to submit our lives to that authority, uh, that we would lean on you for, for transformation, Lord, for guidance, that uh, we would trust that you and you alone have the power to change our hearts. And so, Lord, we ask that you would do so now, that we would worship you as, as our king, that we would bow uh, before your throne, uh, submitting anything that is, is getting in the way of, of our worship of you, of our praise of you, of, of our obedience uh, to you, Lord. That we would surrender that now at your feet and worship you. It's in your name that we pray, Lord. Amen. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive. Spirit lives within me because you died and rose again. It's amazing love. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. Sing, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. Love. Amazing. 
amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all. Jesus, you are our King, and here this morning we submit to you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray and I ask that you help us unpack today's text so that we can apply it to our lives and live appropriately according to your word. May we be reminded of what we just sang throughout today's text, that you are our King. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Man, hello. How's everybody doing? Welcome to Sanger Bible. My name is uh, Pete Hingano. It is a privilege to hang out with you guys. If you guys have your Bibles, or if you are needing a Bible, raise your hand, and one of the elders will get you a Bible or a note card so you can take notes. Obadiah. Obadiah is the book that we're going to be in today. Obadiah. If you can't find it or you don't know where to look, open up the first couple pages of your Bible, the book of contents, and it it is your friend, okay? There is no shame if you don't know where the book of Obadiah is. It's in the Old Testament. It's closer to Matthew than it is to Genesis. Uh, In my uh, 20 font Bible, it's um, the page number is 1800. (laughs) And 65, no lie, that's how many pages, that's the number on, on my Bible, but Obadiah, Obadiah. For the last four weeks, we've had guest speakers here at Singer Bible, and uh, it's been an honor to have, have friends uh, come up here and point you guys to the word, um, and just to hear the stories and what God is doing in and through you guys. And so um, uh, with that said, I'm excited to be back, for us to be back in, uh, in God's word. As you're turning there, let me say this. Pride takes root in all of us in different ways. 
For some, it's an overconfidence in talents and abilities. Uh, For others, it's self-supremacy over peers or the need to be right. Regardless of its form, pride distorts our reality. It deceives us of ourselves. It develops in us a critical spirit, and it detaches us from community. Over the years of ministry, these three things have rang true every time I've met with people who are intentionally in sin. The pride that they have in their heart, it's deceived them to think, hey, I got this. That deception then developed into this critical spirit. Because they think they know better, they then criticize everything and everyone. And then slowly over time, they become disconnected and, dis, uh, and detached from community. And so what's difficult about this is that we live in a society where being prideful is actually highly encouraged. Like whatever your values are, whatever your beliefs are, have pride about it. It's your right. But what's dangerous about this is that pride eventually turns into you thinking that you're better than everybody else. In fact, it gets to the point where you dis- the people that disagree with you, they're wrong. And not just wrong, they're evil. And not just evil, they're your enemies. So then you surround yourself with people who think like you. You hang out and do life with those who agree with you. And collectively, when you guys get together, you start being critical. You start belittling. You start making fun of those who think different. That's what pride does. In my college years from 1999 to about 2004 and five, were years where I had pride uh, in my culture, uh, this deep pride in whoever I, uh, who I was, and I thought I was untouchable. I thought I was untouchable. I thought in a lot of ways that my culture was superior to everybody else's culture, so in some ways I was a racist. I thought physically I was untouchable, so I, could, I would go and do whatever I wanted to do. And so just over the years, I saw how pride had deceived me in those years. And then that deception then led me to, well, then I was critical, and then I was part of this wannabe gang in those years. And so the making fun or belittling others was really just fighting and being stupid. And then I was detached, I was disconnected. Sure, I was home, I still lived with my parents, Man, but I wasn't connected in any way to anybody. How have you seen pride in your life? How has it played out in your life? There's a good chance that it deceived you to thinking that you were better than who you were. There's a good chance you became critical and you complained about others. And there's a good chance that it led you then to being detached from community. The new book that we're starting today is the book of Obadiah. It's the shortest book in the Bible. Obadiah is found in the Old Testament. You guys just saw that. And he's a minor prophet. Not because his message is minor. Rather because his message is short. 21 verses long. That's all the, uh, what Obadiah is. And so today we're only going to focus it on, on today. Verse 1 through 14 today. And then the rest next week. And then we'll be done with the book. <laughs> Woohoo! Okay. So if you're new to the faith. Guess what? You, you're going to be done with the book of the Bible in two weeks. And that's so good. And let's celebrate. We, we finished Matthew, which took like two lifetimes. Okay, and now we're doing Obadiah. So today, verses 1 through 14, what we're going to see clearly in verses 1 through 14 is the pride of this nation. God is going to speak clearly to, through Obadiah, and he's going to speak to this nation, and he's going to say, hey, judgment is coming upon you. Why? Because of their pride. So today's text is going to serve us in two ways. Number one is going to be a reminder. Number two is going to be a warning. Number one, it's it's going to be a reminder that God's justice will reign. That everybody who has purposely, intentionally mocked and made fun of God and his followers as Christians, everybody who have chosen themselves instead of God, one day God's justice will reign. They will be judged. 
And so today's text is going to remind us of that. It's also going to be a warning of what could become of us if we're not careful, if we allow pride to take root and grow. So Obadiah chapter 1, that's the only chapter in Obadiah, verse 1. Look at the first four words, the vision of Obadiah. God has revealed to Obadiah this vision of what's coming in the future. And so now Obadiah's job is to relay what God had revealed to him to this nation. Now, who's Obadiah? Well, Obadiah is a common name back back in those days. And throughout the scripture, all of scripture, there's 13 different people named Obadiah, 13 different men. The Obadiah that we see in today's text is a prophet. A prophet is a messenger of God who has been sent by God to speak on behalf of God. This is why it says in the next sentence of verse 1, it says, Thus says the Lord concerning Edom. Okay, Obadiah is bringing a message to Edom. Now, who's Edom? Like, what, what, what kind of nation is this? Edom, they're also known as the Edomites. Okay, they are a nation southeast on the, on there on the southeast side of Israel. And so they're neighbors to Israel. Both Edom and Israel are, are next to each other. And the, their rich, and their history is it's rich. It's also complicated. You see, the fathers of both of these nations, Edom and Israel, are related. Actually, they're more than related. The fathers of both of these nations are twins. If you go back to the book of Genesis chapter 25, you don't have to turn there. I'll turn there. I'll read it for us. In Genesis 25, twin boys are born to a woman named Rebekah. Rebekah is, is the wife of a guy named Isaac. Isaac is the son of Abraham. Who's Abraham? Abraham is the guy I think we all, I can assume most of us would know. Abraham is a guy that God told, hey, leave your country and go to a land that I will show you. And when you get to this land, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. You're going to be a blessing. I will bless you. Who, uh, I'm going to bless those who bless you. I, I'm going to curse you. I curse those who curse you. And all the peoples on the earth are going to be blessed through you. So this is what God tells Abraham. So the twins that are born, they're Abraham's grandkids. Now, Rebecca, the mom, she hasn't been able to have children. And so Isaac prays to God, say, God, can you bless, bless us with children? And so God does. He blesses them with twins. But before they were born, something wasn't going right in the womb of Rebecca. And so I'll read it to us in Genesis chapter 25. If you want to read this story, Genesis chapter 5, 25, 26, and 27, is this, it's a great story of the twins and how they're younger and they're, they're older. And so, but I'll read this to us. This is before they're born. Uh, Genesis chapter 25, verse 22. The children struggle together within her. And she said this, if this, if this is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided, and one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Verse 26, afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the first ever twins in the Bible we see here from the get-go in the womb of Rebecca, they didn't get along. When you read on and read all the way up to Genesis 28, they fought as young boys and they fought as adults. Did you catch what God said to Rebecca in verse 23? The Lord said to her, your, it, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. The two will become nations. And so Jacob becomes the father of Israel, and Esau becomes the father of Edom. And what it says here, the one shall be stronger, and the older, Esau, shall serve the younger. 
What's interesting is of these two nations, God chooses one of the two to become his people. And he chooses Jacob and Israel, which means he doesn't choose Esau and Edom. And so what was already a a very intense uh, relationship, you can imagine, you know, when one is getting chosen and the other wasn't. You can imagine then this rivalry at a younger age, hundreds of years later, we have these two nations, both the Israelites and the Edomites. Now they are enemies. They're related, but they're right next to each other, but they're enemies. So this prophecy that Obadiah is bringing to Edom, this prophecy isn't some random uh, prophecy to some random nation. This prophecy is to relatives. They're the descendants of Abraham. So it makes you think, sure, then whatever God has to say to Edom, man, it can't be that bad. They're like, they're pretty much family. Well, look at the rest of verse 1. We have heard a report from the Lord, and the messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up. Let us rise against her for battle. God here is is rallying the nations to be ready. God is going to to use these nations to bring about what what needs to be done to Edom. Well, what is that? Look at verse 2. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. So right out the gate, God is clear and he's concise what he's going to do. He's going to make them the opposite of what they were. Small among others and hated by many. Why? Look at verse 3. The pride of your heart has deceived you. The pride of your heart has deceived you. Highlight, underline, circle that sentence. The pride of your heart has deceived you. Edom thinks she's better than what she really is. The pride has distorted her view of herself. And she, now she has this unrealistic view of who she is. Keep reading. Look at verse 3. It says, you live, you live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? And though you soar aloft like an eagle, though your nest is set among stars. Do you guys see Edom's pride? Read that again. You live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling. Who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars. Edom thinks she's untouchable. Edom thinks she's unchallenged. Edom thinks she's unrivaled. She's, she's safe and she, she's secure in the clefts of the rocks. She's high like an eagle. She's set among the stars. What does that mean? Edom, this nation, was situated in the mountains of Seir. They lived high in the caves of Mount Seir, which means they had this natural protection from other nations. People couldn't come from above. Why? Because they're too high. People couldn't climb up there. People couldn't approach them from the ground. Why? Because then they'll see them coming. They had the advantage. So logistically, they, they were secure. They were safe. And that turned into a pride to the point that in their mind, it was like, nobody can touch us. We're good. Nobody can touch us. But look at the end of verse 3. From there, I will bring you down, declares the Lord. So sure, other nations can't get to them because of their physical locations, but God can. God does. Look at verses 5 through 9. Not only are they prideful about their untouchable position as a nation, now Eden Eden is prideful of her wealth in verses 5 and 6. Of her alliance in verses 7, of her wisdom in verse 8, and, over, and with her soldiers in verse 9. Look back at verse 5. If thieves come to you, if plunders came by night, how have you been destroyed? Would they, not only, would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would, would they not leave gleanings? 
how Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. We know they live in the mountains, right? We know they live in the mountains. They have this great nation, but what we see here and understand, they have developed a valley through irrigation. And so they have become kind of just trade route. And so, which means that they're wealthy, it's brought them money. And so that's why Obadiah says here in verse five, the thieves are gonna come and they're gonna steal from you. Why? Because they got money. God says, you're gonna be left with nothing. Typically, the grape gatherers would come and they'll only pick like 80% of the harvest and they'll leave the rest for, for, the, for, the not, uh, for the, those who, who, who can't buy it. Okay, it's kind of how they would do it back in those days. They'll allow, they'll pick 80% of the harvest and they'll leave the 20% for those who couldn't afford it so they can go pick it themselves and have food. What's happening here is the grape gatherers will leave nothing. Nothing. Eden will be ransacked. Every grape will be taken. Everything will be stripped away. Eden will be desolate. Here in verse 6, when it says how Esau has been pillaged, the author uses Esau. Esau is a synonym for Edom, much as Jacob is often used as a synonym for Israel. Look at verse 7. All your allies have driven you to your, to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. Well, Obadiah is saying, he was like, hey, those who you think are your allies, they're actually your enemies. Like they're, you're, you're deceived by them. Like they're, they're eating with you, but really they're just they're lying to you. You have no understanding Then it goes in verse 8, will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau. Verse 9, and your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, which is Edom's capital city, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. You see, Edom's pride in their their wise and the wise men and their pride in their soldiers. God says, both, you're going to be cut off by slaughter. I think we know this, but let, I'll just ask, just so that we're all on the same page. Why, why is God bringing destruction upon Edom? Pride. Pride has led them to be arrogant. Pride has led them to be cocky, haughty, puffed up, conceited. And so through Obadiah, God says, Edom, you're done. There's nothing that could render you safe, nothing. Your geographical location, nothing. Your wealth, nope. Your wise guys, they're not smart enough. Your military power, not even close. Nothing can save them from God's judgment. What's interesting about pride is whenever a people or a community or a nation becomes fixated about themselves, it's hard for them to then love others. I think about a time when you were prideful. Think about a time when you wanted to be right and it was your way or the highway. I can guarantee you it was probably hard for you to love and care and have compassion for someone or for that person. Look at verse 10. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, Shame shall cover you and shall be cut off forever. On that day, verse 11, you stood aloof. On the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were, one, you were like one of them. And so this pride that they've had for years, it has dulled them to, to have the ability to, to have care and compassion And so what we see here is the issues that Jacob and Esau had as children, as twins, it's become magnified in their descendants. Like Esau's pride and anger has uh, has inflated in Edom. Like to the point where there's people coming in, nations coming in, and they're they're battling, they're fighting, they're taking over, they're conquering Israel, and they're doing nothing. You know the hate's real, when they stand by and watch Israel get attacked and conquered. 
So what does Obadiah, what does God say through Obadiah? Look at verse 12. Do not gloat over the day of your brother and the day of this misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gates of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off the fugitives. And do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. I know it sounds like that God is calling them out and warning them, hey, don't do this. But the way it's written in the, in the Hebrew is really God calling them out for gloating, for rejoicing, for boasting, for raiding, for delighting, and for looting, for partnering against Israel. So not only did they stand by and watch family get conquered and captured, Edom took advantage of the opportunity. They became opportunists and they joined. And they entered in the gates of Israel. They looted and raided Israel, joyfully too. And they were every bit of the enemies of Israel. To see how, how, how pride can can just deceive you from understanding and believing who you are? Do you see what what pride does when you let it take root and grow? It makes you think that you're better than who you really are. It makes you look down upon others. It gives you false hope and security. And, And it really leads us to thinking, man, I got this. I don't need help. This is Edom. So God sends Obadiah to help them see the fact of their pride, the faults that were produced from their pride, and their fate because of pride. Look at verse 10 again. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. Their hope and their secured home their futility and their wealth, their arrogance and their wise men, their trust in their soldiers, all of that cut off forever. Forever. Think of a time, think of a situation where pride was what was leading you instead of the Holy Spirit. It could be with your spouse. It could have been with your neighbors. Think of a time where you would rather be right or you look down upon somebody. It could have been with your siblings. For the new seventh graders in here, welcome. But think about it. It could be with a coworker while you're driving? Serious. And in everything that we do as humans, there is a little bit of pride in there. Our hearts are deceiving. Our hearts are evil. And so the natural thing our hearts are always going to do is lean towards ourselves. And if we let it grow, if we let it develop, it's going to lead us in this direction. It's going to deceive us to thinking that we're better than others. It's going to lead us then, it's going to create in us this critical spirit where we complain and criticize others all the time. And lastly, it's going to lead us to be detached and disconnected from community. While we were doing student ministry for eight years, we noticed this pattern when students were doing something that we didn't agree with, or they knew that it was a sin. You can tell in their, their actions. You can tell in their attitude towards others. Eventually, 
they'll stop coming around. That same thing is true with us as adults. Every time I sit down with somebody who's intentionally in sin, they have this this unrealistic view of themselves. They think they're up here. And so when they're talking to me, all they're doing is criticizing others. Spouse, children, coworkers, whatever it is. And then when I ask them, hey, well, tell me about your community. Tell me about your life group. Oh, I haven't been in one. I don't need that. It's a cycle. It's true in our lives, and it's true here in Eden. And so that's why this book serves us in two ways. Number one, it's a reminder. Like all of us, this is a reminder that God will one day, he is going to deal with all those who are prideful. Everyone who laughs in our face because we're believers in Jesus. Everyone who mocks us because our Lord and Savior has given us a new life. Everyone who is purposely seeking to destroy God and his, his designs. We see here, God will take care of the prideful. One day, his justice will reign forever. And those who have chosen themselves, God is going to take care of them. So that's a reminder. Okay? There's a little bit of part of me, I'm going to be honest. That's like, man, I can't wait for that day. Okay? But that's a little bit of pride too. (laughs) But it's like, man, I cannot wait for that day. This book also serves as a warning. As we sit here and unpack all 14 verses here, it's a warning. Don't be like this nation. Don't think you're superior. Don't trust in your wealth. Don't rely on your wisdom and don't hide behind your security. We know the world that we live in. We know non-believers. We expect Folks who don't believe in Jesus Christ, we expect them to be prideful. We see it every day. We see everything that's happening in the world today. There's this, there's this push for, for identity. There's this push for all these things because everybody's become so prideful of these things. They think they're better. They think they know and they think that God is really nothing. And so they are now their own gods. We know that's happening outside in our world. We expect it from non-believers to act this way. But what's sad is we Christians look all too similar to the world. Humility is not a word that is used to describe us. Jesus, yes. His followers, not so much. And I get it, we're all sinners. Like, we will all make mistakes. But because we know that we're sinners and because we know that Jesus is going to save us, because we know our sin has been forgiven, it doesn't give us permission to keep on sinning. Because we know our Savior is going to forgive us, it doesn't give us permission to look down upon others. It doesn't give us permission to be critical and criticize others. In fact, it should be the opposite. Because we know what we've been forgiven, all the more we should be humble and being the light in this dark world. But there's a pride. There's this low-grade arrogance that's swirling among Christians. There's this critical spirit that's moving among Christians. And slowly but surely... We Christians are becoming isolated from each other, isolated from the church, and disconnected from the community. Do you guys know what's causing all this? Yeah, I, it's pride, okay? We, we know that, but let me be a little bit specific. For the last few years, our lifestyle, our comforts, Our security, our wealth, they have been challenged, have been questioned, and they're changing. And I think the reason why 
we're puffing up our chest, the reason why we're becoming a little bit arrogant, the reason why we're conceited, we're, we're, we're like, no, I'm not moving, is because our way of life is getting changed, it's getting pushed, and it's getting challenged. And so instead of responding in the way that Jesus would, where we're clamming up, we're tightening up, and we're allowing our flesh to spill out, and we'll say, no, and we're becoming prideful. When you look at the life of Jesus, when you look at what the life that he came and lived, that's the life that he's asking us now to live. And so this book, today's a warning. It's a warning. It's a warning. Don't be like Edom. And so just for us to examine ourselves, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. This is what Paul is telling the church. So as a, as a way to respond to today's text, I want us to examine ourselves. And so I have here a list of questions I'm just going to ask. If you want these list of questions, shoot me an email or a text. I'll send it to you. But this will just kind of help us understand this. I can, am I prideful? Number one, ask. Do I think, act, or live as if I'm better than others? Maybe you can't answer that yourself. So maybe ask your spouse. Maybe ask a coworker. Maybe ask your children. Ask, who, what am I critical of? Or better yet, ask, who do I complain about the most? Next, ask, is my circle of friends and family, is it only those who think and value the things I do? Have I excluded others? Ask, in conversations, I prefer to speak about myself and have others talk about me. Is that true? Ask, in most situations, I'm thinking about how things will benefit me, reflect on me, and work in my favor. Ask, when somebody says I'm offended, that when somebody says I have offended them, I tend to think, well, that's your problem. Ask, how often do I think things will be way better if you just did it my way? Ask yourself, do I only serve others when it benefits me? These are just questions just to help you examine your heart to see if you're prideful. And there's a lot of ways that pride can manifest and to keeping you from following the Lord. And so if you want to help this next week, if you want to process through this, let us know. We'll love to come alongside you. But let me leave you with this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves before, uh, therefore, sorry, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. For all the believers here, we are called to imitate, imitate Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, that's the attitude that we ought to have. That's who God has called us to be. For all the non-believers here, you have not humbled yourself before the Lord yet. And so in some ways, you're not his child. And so if you're here today and you're understanding the life that you're living is this prideful life and it's keeping you away from, from the Lord, today's your day that I pray that you'll place your faith in Jesus Christ. You're still gonna have this pride in you, but the Holy Spirit's gonna come and dwell in your heart and through his word and through the church, the Holy Spirit is gonna transform you. You are no longer yourself. You are now his. Your identity is gonna be Christ. He now, through the Holy Spirit and through the word and through the church, will get rid of the pride that's in you. Let's pray. Jesus, 
it's easy for us to point to you and say that we're going to follow you and we're going to imitate you. But then we go out into this world and there's all sorts of things coming at us. And so Jesus, I pray that our time of ex- uh, that our time where we examine our hearts and our minds, the time that we put into really asking the hard questions to see what where pride is in our hearts, the areas and the parts of our lives that we're that are holding on tight to that we have not let go to you, Jesus, I pray. I pray that we will remember the life that you lived, the humility that you expressed, and that we'll follow you. Jesus, the pride in us, we just want to fight and we just want to be right. So I ask the Holy Spirit that you give us the strength, Holy Spirit. That you give us the boldness to ask the questions, to examine ourselves. And you'll give us the courage to confess and repent whatever pride or whatever sin issues come up. Holy Spirit, do your work. Jesus, as we sang right before the sermon that you are our king. I pray that that rings true right now as the Holy Spirit is working through us. We pray this in your name. Amen.
Everything that we are called to do is to do unto the Lord. Where he places us, where we live, work, and play is do for the Lord, is to further the kingdom. And so whenever we allow pride to take root and grow in us, it prevents us from furthering the kingdom. And so that's why Paul says, examine yourself. And so sometimes we we, we get so, okay, I need to do, I need to. No, truly examine yourselves. So my encouragement this week is whatever the Holy Spirit brought up to you, let somebody know. Your spouse, if you have a core group of people, confess and repent and allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through you. Our goal, the job that God has given us is to further his kingdom. So let's do the work that we can do in examining ourselves to get rid of the pride so that we can continue to be fixated on Jesus. Go be the church. Have a great Sunday. Go be the church. If you missed any announcements, you go to the connect table. If you're staying for the Bixlers, in about 10 minutes, we'll be in here. Have a great Sunday.